Five. How many people? Six. Let's do it. Let's let's start. It's probably one. Hey, good morning. Uh, welcome to our braided Easter bread virtual class today. Um, I first learned how to make these breads at the Morning Glory Bakery in Bar Harbor, Maine back in 2004. I've been making them on and off ever since. And this year, I really took a deep dive into it. So I'm excited to um, share what I've learned and how to make them together this morning. So uh, a couple of rules for our virtual classroom if you wouldn't mind putting yourself on you. Um, and if you have a question for me, that's what I'm here for, please don't hesitate to ask questions this morning. You can type it into uh, the chat box at the bottom of your screen. And my husband, Marley, hey, Marley, thank you. He is uh, filming today and moderating. So he'll ask the question out loud for you uh, when we have good stopping points. So um, I'm going to walk you step-by-step step through the dough from mixing your starter to putting the dough in the oven. And if you are baking along with me and you wanna mix the dough together, you just wanna have your starter and all those ingredients ready. We're gonna mix the dough in about 10 to 15 minutes. And um, if you are wanting to shape the dough with me this morning, then you'll need to have uh, your dough ready uh, to be divided and pre-shaped. So, if you're doing neither of those, great. I hope you've got coffee, tea, you're relaxing and um, just enjoying the show. So again, questions in the chat box at the bottom and put yourself on mute. So um, like I said, I started making these breads at the Morning Glory Bakery in Bar Harbor, Maine in around 2004. And at that time, I believe it was just a somewhat enriched, meaning um, milk, eggs, butter, maybe some oil, and sugar in the dough uh, and uh, braided into a wreath and packed with beautiful colored eggs. And Amanda, I don't know if you're watching this morning, but uh, Amanda and I worked together at the Morning Glory Bakery. So, hey, Amanda, what's up? Uh, I'm so honored that you are watching this morning. And uh, it, that bread left such a big impression on me. It wasn't like anything I'd ever seen. And one of the questions I get so much with this bread is how do you eat it? Um, it's unusual. And uh, so the answer is you just cut it and you get these um, really fun slices of the whole egg. My daughter loves it. Um, and it is a really fun celebratory bread. It invites participation. It is unusual. Do you tear it? Do you cut it with a knife? There's a whole egg in a shell in it. Um, and so it's great for the spring holiday table to just get people using their hands, sharing that food together and just really uh, enjoying the spring season. So it's very cold right here now, but I'm saying spring. Uh, so the loaf that I personally like to make the most is this example. Um, I like to cut it into wedges. I think that this works really well. Um, the wreath can be purely decorative if you'd like to make this dough as a wreath. Uh, to hang on your door or as a centerpiece you can. Uh, this is a braided version that uh, I decided to use some sprinkles and some slivered almonds. Those are also very popular uh, toppings for a braided Easter bread. So this is more of a long braid um, that I'll show you how to do today. And um, from, so, Easter breads in my research this year. So I'm living out of a suitcase and I'm really clinging on to some um, ritualistic holiday traditions. It's just really bringing some joy into my day. So researching this bread, um, again, my version, I just learned um, when I was a young baker, but this is a very old bread and it's been used in Easter rituals, uh, mostly through Eastern Europe. And I learned a lot about um, Greek Easter breads, Tzareki, and uh, Italian Easter breads, Pan de Pasqua. And um, in Italy, Calabria, they make these special dolls uh, with a very similar dough to what we're making today. So I just played around with some shapes. This is a twist, and you put the egg in, uh, and you do a little breaded cross over it. 
and these are given out to children uh, around Easter. And so some of you might know, I have a almost two year old. Her birthday is, she was born on Easter. So sometimes her birthday will be on Easter. And I can't wait to um, hand her over these beautiful dolls when the class is over. Um, so I'll cover several different kinds of shapes. I just wanted to show you an example of what we'll be making today. And now we'll get into um, the ingredients and the process. So this dough uh, is an enriched dough. And what that means, we're taking a, a basic sourdough. So primary ingredients here are uh, bread flour, all-purpose flour, and a little bit of whole wheat flour. And then we've got uh, milk, oil, eggs, butter, and a few other um, spices. And so enriched dough just means that it's got all those extra lovely things to it. And, you know, this bread eaten around Easter, we're coming out of Lent, a period of restraint. So we're starting to put some fun things back into our, our bread. So um, the flour that I like to use is King Arthur uh, bread flour. It comes in a white and blue bag. Um, you can get that at basically any grocery store. And it's sort of foolproof. So if you're new to making this bread, that's what I recommend. I also use the King Arthur All Purpose. For the whole wheat, I have a lovely stone ground, freshly milled flour from Carolina Browns in Asheville, North Carolina, a whole wheat portion. So it's got all the germ, all the bran, all the good stuff, and a ton of flavor. Um, so that's what I'm using for um, the flour base. The all-purpose flour gives it um, a little tenderness, so it's not super chewy. If you just have only bread flour, um, you can absolutely go ahead and use that. And um, if you just have like a freshly milled stone bread flour, like um, today I'll be using a little bit of this um, from Deep Roots Milling. This is their um, beautiful bread flour. Um, when you're using freshly milled stone bread flours, you want to um, add a little bit of extra liquid as you're mixing the dough. So I'll get into that when we do the mix. But uh, going down, I'm just going down our list here. Um, the eggs, so just going through ingredients. Um, eggs are uh, bountiful, right? This time of year, the, uh, I believe this is the most productive time. So if you can find uh, for these breads, uh, anything from like a heritage bird or uh, a unique breed or just different colors. Personally, I think it has a beautiful rustic look to it with an undyed egg, meaning a natural color. So uh, these are some of my favorite right now. They have almost like an olive hue to them. It's mind boggling, they're so beautiful. So uh, hit up your farmer's market or your local co-op. And this is something where you don't wanna uh, skip on the eggs. There's a lot of things that I make, like if I'm making brownies, you know, I'm not going to use my $12 eggs, but this bread, this is celebratory, this is where I want to go um, in on the eggs. Um, and then we've got um, butter. I like to use the flugra, and before you start mixing your dough, you're going to want to go ahead and have it already cubed up, and then I just keep it um, in the foil or in a container. Um, that it came in. So we've got that. Uh, milk, again, um, we're lucky to have access to a lot of beautiful milk um, here in Loudoun County, Virginia, which is where I just moved to. We are in Hamilton, Pittsburgh area. Uh, great farm scene. And so delicious milk will also just, um, anytime you can invest in uh, high quality dairy ingredients for an enriched dough, it's really going to show in the final um, flavor. It's just going to be so complex and beautiful. So you have nice milk if you can source it, nice eggs if you come across it. Um, for sugar, I'm just using, um, I prefer just the unbleached granulated sugar. I believe this is like Florida crystals. Olive oil. There's not a ton of olive oil in this dough. Um, originally, I only made this dough with olive oil and I didn't incorporate the butter. Um, I guess, you know, during Lent, you're not supposed to be partaking in animal fat. So there's a lot of lean doughs. 
uh, during the Lenten season. And so I was trying to stick with that idea, but the butter just makes it so luscious that I, I had to um, start adding the butter. You can omit the butter if you'd like to have um, a firmer dough. So olive oil, uh, and then um, you want a couple of interesting spices, which we'll talk about. And then of course, honey, a really nice honey into the dough, sweetener. I did um, begin this dough without the sugar as well and just did it with the honey. And I felt that the sugar did actually um, kick up the flavor a little bit. So you can omit the sugar if you like a simpler bread. All right, we already talked about the bread flour. Salt for all my doughs. I use the pink Himalayan sea salt just for the pure fact that uh, a lot of my doughs, I will give a period of rest for adding the salt. And when the salt is the color, I can see if I've added it into the dough or not. Um, it does have a little minerality to it. So uh, it does add a little bit to the flavor. Um, if you only have coarse salt on hand, sometimes that happens. You go ahead and use that. You just want to dissolve it in a little bit of hot water first. And in general, I don't use anything iodized. So like a, any kind of fine sea salt um, will work for your dough. Um, you're gonna do zest of a whole orange. So uh, make sure you know, you're know you using the skin, um, you wanna get an organic um, navel orange. Um, and so the spices are interesting for this bread. Um, apparently cinnamon uh, was added. It was one of the spices um, that was used, they say, to anoint Jesus's body. And so cinnamon has a really significant role um, in this bread dough. And then um, mallet, which is, um, this is from Turkey, this ingredient here. I hadn't heard of it before this year, um, but it's in a lot of um, Greek Easter braided breads. And it's from the um, seed or the uh, pit of a mahalik cherry. And um, it's ground into a very fine powder. And it's incredibly aromatic. We were just talking about it before the workshop started. And uh, it's rosy, it's floral, it also has a little bitterness to it, and it's uh, very perfumey. It sort of fills up the house with like an almond cherry um, aroma, and so it's quite distinctive. We've been making these breads every morning uh, for fun and for the workshop, and so uh, every morning our house is filled with this very unique um, spice here. So again, Mahalo. I ordered this online, um, I have not been able to find it in the grocery store. And if you don't have it, that's okay. Uh, but lots of things to try um, as maybe you're gonna make this, you know, every year for your special Easter bread. And then of course, sourdough starter. So all my breads are naturally leavened. Uh, we're using natural leavening for the bacterial uh, element. There's about a um, hundred lactobacilli bacteria to one part yeast in sourdough starter. Um, I keep a couple different kinds. There's actually a slivered almond and some sprinkles in this one right now. So if you're wondering what is in there, um, that is in there. But um, this is my primary starter. Uh, this is the base of everything. And I feed this a uh, whole grain flour. Oh, oh! <laughs> I can't quite see the camera angle. Well, there you go. Bloopers reel. <laughs> we'll save that for like, TV. So um, this is my whole grain starter. And uh, we live with a toddler and a bunch of dogs. And so our this is just, it's hilarious. Spills happen, you guys. So um, whole wheat flour, uh, warm water. I pour most of what's in the container out. So about 75%. And then I feed back that 25% equal parts whole grain flour. So whole wheat flour from Carolina Grounds. Um, and a little bit of warm water. And this is my base starter that I've been tending to for, um, I guess, 10 years. Um, I got it at the end of my bakery job at Farm and Sparrow in Asheville, North Carolina. I've been carrying it around since then. So um, I needed to make several breads today. So I made what's called 11. And if you have heard of these before or heard of this, um, some people call their starter 11. So that can be a little confusing. Closer to me. Okay, sorry, getting a little camera direction closer to me. Um, 
So 11, I make it anytime I need to make more than one dough. So say you're gonna make several of these, you're gonna make two, you're gonna make four. Um, you'll pull from your starter and just make a larger amount. But I just wanted to clarify what 11 is and show it to you. Um, and so your dough is gonna have, I believe about a hundred grams of your sourdough starter. So at the beginning of the process, um, you're going to want to take your sourdough starter. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm gonna do the tools and then we'll get into the flow of the mix. So that's what I have on ingredients. Do we have any questions about ingredients at the moment? Okay. So um, tools, very simple. The spread is a showstopper, I think, but um, it doesn't require a lot, which is great because we are, my family's living out of a suitcase right now. If we can make this bread that way, you can definitely make it at home. So digital scale. This is the brand that I prefer. It's called My Way. Um, nobody's paying me to say that, but I ordered these online from a website called Webstaurant. And um, it is the scale that I prefer. I like that the platform is lifted up. And, um, you know, the digital display has a light behind it, which is really nice. Um, I don't prefer a glass digital scale. And everything is in grams in this recipe. Um, if that's new for you, I feel your pain. Um, it actually took me a while to come around to using grams. But essentially, you will um, turn on your digital scale. You'll put your bowl on top of it. And then you can add each dry ingredient, all the flowers, all the sugar, the salt, the spices. I include the zest there. Um, one by one, and after you add each ingredient, you just press the tear button. You don't have to keep a tally of them. Um, you know, as you add, no math in your head, don't worry. Um, so just tear after each addition and um, saves you on all the cups and tablespoons and teaspoons. If you're looking at me thinking that's ridiculous, I'm asking you to weigh out three grams of cinnamon. Uh, you have my sympathy and one thing I do is just actually put the ingredient in my hand and then um, you know go ahead and put it in the bowl. So I have a little moment to pause and look at it uh, before it goes in. And you know if you put too much cinnamon or too much sugar or any of these ingredients, you can just you know with uh, some bigger. You don't want to let it rest on the scale and go dormant, but you can just scoop stuff out too. So don't be afraid to use the scale. That's my digital scale PSA. Uh, my mom and I were just together for two months. We did a ton of baking and she was new to using a digital scale. She's in her 70s and um, she really came around to it. So I'm so pleased. Baker by baker. Um, really simple. Just a sheet pan with some parchment lined paper. You want, a, I call this a bench knife. I call this a dough scraper. It's just um, great for a little flexible plastic scraper. You can get them uh, online. King Arthur has a great version of this, but it helps uh, scrape the side of your mixing bowl better than anything else will. Um, you do want a pastry brush, uh, just a flexible uh, spatula or spoon to get all your um, wet ingredients together. The only Thing that you might not have on hand besides the digital scale is just this microplane for zesting um, the orange and um, another kind of unusual but if you make a lot of bread probably not um, a digital thermometer so wheat-based doughs which this is uh, primary wheat-based bread dough when they're done mixing you want them to be somewhere between 75 and 78 degrees that's called your desired dough temperature so um, there's a calculation you can do to get the exact temperature of your liquid ingredients for this dough, but I haven't uh, bothered to do that. We've been making great bread. So if you want the worksheet or desired dough temperature, just send me an email and I'm happy to work that uh, through with you. But right now we just have everything room temp. So digital thermometer can help you if you're struggling with your dough. Maybe it's too cold, maybe it's too warm. When you're done mixing, just pop that thermometer into the dough and it'll give you some knowledge and help you figure out if your dough is really cold, like say it's 68 degrees, you're gonna wanna put it somewhere warm um, while it's rising. And if it's somewhere hot, you wanna stick it um, in a chilly location, probably not the fridge, uh, just we'll forget about it in there. But um, again, and then you can cool it down. So a uh, digital thermometer, we based bread dough somewhere between 
um, 75 to 78 degrees to set you up for good fermentation. So flavor and strength can develop at the same time. And then a whisk or a fork um, to mix together your slurry. Okay, that's it for the two. So now we can get into actually uh, mixing the dough. Um, but we're going to leapfrog around this morning um, because we've got the oven on and um, the fan is very loud. So I'm going to show you how to um, proof the dough, egg wash it, fill it with the eggs. We'll pop it in the oven. It'll probably bake for about half an hour. And um, then we can go ahead and turn this fan off. So uh, the overall process for this dough, you have a couple of different options. So um, you can feed your, I feed my starter. I'll walk you through what I do. I take out my starter from the refrigerator, say, Friday night, um, I'm going to refresh it. So I pour most of it out, feed it back, um, equal parts flour and water, put the cover on loosely. So I'll cover it and then just give it a little quarter turn to let some airflow. Leave it uh, room temp overnight. That's 68 to 72 degrees Fahrenheit for me. Uh, the following morning around uh, eight o'clock, I'll mix the bread dough. I'll mix the bread dough, give it a series of folds, um, and then this dough really needs a lot of time to rise. We're sort of asking uh, the sourdough yeast um, a big favor for rising this heavy bread dough, so time is going to work uh, well for this. So I let it um, rise all day. At night, around 8 p.m., um, I'll go ahead and I'll do my pre-shape, my final shape, make the grade, and then um, cover it, um, put it on the sheet pan with parchment, cover it with a dish towel, and actually put it on top of the refrigerator in a little cozy spot to proof overnight. Um, and then I'll bake it the following morning, again, say around eight o'clock. So that's one way you can do it without using any refrigeration. If you'd like to break up the steps, you can also do that. So the second option, uh, would be to, like I wanted a dough ready to shape this morning. So I went through the whole process Friday evening, you feed your sourdough starter, you let it stay out overnight. Saturday morning, you mix your dough, you give it a series of folds, and then at 8 p.m., rather than shaping it, you just go ahead and pop your container of dough into the fridge till the following morning. So Sunday morning, you can take out uh, your container of dough, pre-shape it, shape it, and then you're looking at baking that bread around dinner time on Sunday. So the dough is flexible and uh, you can do uh, a lot with refrigeration if you need to start and stop the process. So uh, here we have, I shaped this uh, here in the kitchen last night at uh, around 8 p.m. And it's just a simple braid. Um, and we want to egg wash it. And we're going to place the eggs in. So the egg wash here is a equal blend of heavy cream and egg yolk. I don't use any egg white. And we may, um, depending on the color that we get with the dough, I might want to egg wash this twice. In general, with enriched doughs like a brioche or something else, I will egg wash the bread um, three times, my friends and I call it um, the nail polish move, because it basically uh, looks like there's lacquer uh, on the top of the bread by the third um, coat of egg wash, and it's really stunning. So it's an easy trick to get bakery style bread in your home oven uh, with the egg wash. So you want to um, egg wash it once before it goes in the oven. And uh, this dough does have olive oil, honey, sugar, butter. So it is going to color beautifully um, anyways. But egg wash, you've got to egg wash. Um, so you want to be really thorough. And when it comes to the eggs, you can uh, use raw eggs. So the recipe that you received uh, says to do ahead, um, soft boil, I believe six eggs for your dough. Uh, 
I have tried it both ways and I prefer them each for different reasons. So uh, if you forget that step, you don't have your eggs hard boiled, you can nestle them in the dough raw. And after about 45 minutes of baking, it gives you like sort of a medium boiled egg. They're totally edible. Um, but sometimes they do crack in odd ways. And so I've found that hard boiling them beforehand, or excuse me, soft boiling them. So I do a, a seven minute egg, um, allows me to see where the imperfection is going to show up. And then I can kind of hide it in the brain. But, uh, you know, these are the things I like to obsess over. So try it both ways and see what you like. Um, today, we're actually doing combination these eggs have been soft boiled. So I do um, pot of boiling water, rolling boil, place the eggs in seven minutes. I love a seven minute egg. It's great for the cheese plate. Uh, and then seven minutes, spoon them out, put them in the ice bath and then chill them. So that's how I like to do my eggs in general. Uh, okay, so we are egg washed. The oven is on um, to 450. I'm gonna place the eggs in the dough. We'll put it in the oven, we'll set a timer for 10 minutes, and then we'll check on it. We'll reduce the oven temperature, and potentially give it another coat of egg wash. Um, and so you've got your gorgeous braise, and I have found that it's much easier to wiggle the eggs into the dough uh, when it's nice and proofed and soft. After you've braided the dough, it's still really tight. So I hate kind of fighting the dough to put the eggs in that. So I like to just alternate into these. So here, 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 here. And I kind of keep going with a, you know, if there's a direction that they're going in. like keeping all of the, I, I prefer to shove the, the, we're talking about the egg, the bottom and the top. I prefer to uh, shove the bottom in, poke the bottom in. Oh. And also um, do a few extra as your uh, calls for six eggs, but just go ahead and make a dozen. Um, then you've got some extra. All I did was crack the shell, but now I'm excited to eat it. Okay, so the eggs are in. And then what I'll do last minute is any portion that as you place the eggs in the dough that gets revealed, going to brush with a little bit more egg wash here. All right. So lovely. You can, uh, again, I was talking about um, trying to get, you know, colored eggs um, just naturally. Uh, you can draw on the eggs with, if you had a, a finer brush with the egg wash and it browns and it kind of leaves like a, a fun pattern. We painted some polka dots and some stripes on with my daughter this week and that was really fun. So if you've got extra egg wash and a, a little brush, you could do that. Okay, great. So here's our bread. We're going to pop it in. Can you set a timer to your minute? Okay. Wonderful. So, uh, any questions so far? Okay. Oh, Marley is uh, asking me to remind you that if you do have a question, you can just type it into the chat box. So I have been baking for quite a long time and I have always 
taken pride in using my two hands to mix my bread dough. Um, and this winter, um, I got into enriched bread. So, you know, um, cinnamon roll dough, donuts, artosi, um, all of the delicious things that you eat before lunch that have all the fat, all the sugar, all the sprinkles, all the chocolate. And um, once I started doing that, I realized that I really needed to embrace a mixer. So maybe you already mix all your bread dough with a mixer, um, or maybe you're a little bit like me and you prefer to mix by hand so you get that sensory activity. Um, I will encourage you to use a mixer for this because you are incorporating butter and it's just a lot harder to do that by hand. The other thing that we get with using a mixer, um, if you notice I'm using the paddle attachment today rather than a dough hook, um, what I like to do with my enriched doughs uh, is get as much air incorporated into the bread dough as possible as I'm mixing it. And the paddle attachment, the way that it's designed, just incorporates rather than the dough hook that's winding the dough and strengthening the gluten network that way, the paddle is it is going to separate it, but it's going to whip air into it at the same time. And so I actually prefer that for my enriched bread doughs because we are asking, um, again, that small portion of yeast that will multiply to populate your bread dough producing gas, uh, a big ask. So um, as the yeast is producing gas in the dough, if it can travel and meet larger pockets of air, like the air that will be incorporated through using the paddle attachment, you're gonna have an even better rise. So uh, in the bowl, I already have weighed out. It's just a little baker's tip. Um, I call it the way out. I do it the night before I mix any bread dough. And this is whether it's just for me personally or for a class, sort of like the baker's me sun floss. So um, I'll weigh everything out. So dry ingredients here, all my wet ingredients are ready to go. My butter is cubed and then I can just relax into the process. So we've got all the flours, um, the sugar, the spices, the zest and the salt um, in here. And then already combined, we've got um, the egg, the milk, um, the honey, the olive oil um, and the sourdough starter. So this dough, um, I am using um, from the Woodson's Mill um, freshly milled stone ground flour here in my bowl. Freshly milled stone ground flour needs a little bit extra hydration, so a little bit extra water or moisture in the dough um, because it has that presence of the bran, and the bran in the dough is just going to soak up all that water. So when I'm working with a freshly milled stone ground flour, I like to have an uh, extra portion of either it's milk or water, whatever that primary liquid is. Here today, it's actually a lot of liquids that are making up the uh, hydration content of the dough. But um, milk is the obvious choice to drizzle in, so that's why we're using the milk. Uh, I'm going to let the dough uh, moisten and mix, and then if I see some dryness in the bottom, I'm just gonna pour this in over the side very slowly so you get to that right amount of hydration. Um, and it can feel scary if you're not used to it, but um, you know, there's always a little adjustment when you're baking. So um, I'm gonna turn it on to stir and let's see if I can move it a little bit closer, if you can possibly see in, um, just to combine the ingredients. Okay, great. And then I'm gonna go ahead and pour in the Wet. Want to give it a minute just to see how well it's hydrated, and then I'm going to turn it up because we're just not sure. You might have to um, hold your mixer down a little bit. Okay. Uh, 
so it's going to want to climb the gel hook. That's totally natural. But um, can you get it in there? I'll take it. I'll just take the paddle out. So it's got some dry crumble on the bottom and it was mixed pretty thoroughly. So I'm going to take it all off. You just want to use your hand, get in there, take it all off the paddle. I'm going to turn it back on and I'm going to drizzle um, about half of this milk into the bowl. So that's how you can tell if you've mixed it pretty good and there's still um, dry crumble on the bottom, you're going to need a little bit more milk. But already the dough is so pleasant and aromatic. It is a sticky dough in general. Um, so if you're wondering if you're mixing along with me and it feels tacky to you, that's totally normal for this dough. Okay. Turn it on again and drizzle in the milk. So it is evenly hydrated, meaning that it is a uniform color. It's sort of like a golden brown and like a, a fawn. And um, it's pulled away from the sides of the bowl. And uh, yeah, it's just nice and homogenized. There's nothing dry on the bottom. There's nothing on the sides of the bowl. It shouldn't take too long to pull together. Um, I believe in the recipe, it says to mix it for three full minutes now. I'm gonna uh, skip that for you and just cheat a little bit here. Go ahead and add the butter now. Uh, so as you can see, I used very little of the milk that was here. So, you know, weigh out like 30 grams, which is like around a tablespoon. So if you're prone to, you know, having a heavy hand with a candy, make sure that you, you know, just add enough till it comes together. All right, so the butter is room temp, it's good to go. This could be a little bit softer. This would be, if we're making croissants, this would be perfect. The butter's in what I call the pliable waxy state. And uh, you want to turn the mixer on. You're gonna add each little pat or chunk of butter until uh, you don't see it in the bowl anymore. And then uh, you'll, Turn the dough out into its vessel to rise in. So you do also want to have, um, I have ready a greased um, mixing bowl with a lid. And you watch it go from a stiff dough to just this luscious, almost batter-like dough, which is, I just love this transition as you add the butter. <laughs> Uh, my husband and I, our family, our, our toddler is here with her grandmother in the other room. Uh, we have been moving since January, and I have used so many different mixers in the past couple months. It's really great. They all have their own personality. So this is my father-in-law's mixer that he loves. He graciously let us use it this morning. But it's fun to think of your, you know, people say your you begin to be like your dog. It's funny to think of you on the personality of your mixer. We're almost there. Oh, 
Okay, we're going to check out the dough. Baking. Okay. Looks good. I'm going to give it a oh. I'm going to give it one more coat of egg wash now. So that was 10 minutes in. Oh, it smells so good. I wish I could translate it. Sure, you could, yes, if you, if you feel that your dough is too wet, go ahead and add a little bit more all purpose. Uh, but just sprinkle in like a tablespoon at a time. Uh, all flowers will hydrate or absorb water differently. So if we're using different flowers, it's not uncommon um, to have differences in how your dough looks when you're done mixing. So trust, trust your gut. I will show you, I'm about to show you what my dough looks like. And also maybe that will take care of some questions of, you know, it feels really wet because it almost looks like you're not going to be able to handle it. But given an hour rest, um, and I'll show you how we're going to fold it, and we, it becomes clear. So, okay, back into the oven. All right, I'm going to give it another mix. off the mixer, it is going to look uh, really sticky and um, it won't pull away from the sides. You're going to need a dough scraper to get it. And um, yeah, it has like a batter-like texture. And, uh, you know, because we're using the pile of segment, it might look a little bit shredded. Uh, but we're going to get this all into a waiting greased mixing bowl and I've got one waiting to show you what it will look like in an hour and um, magic happens to the dough between here and um, that first hour so got my little dough scraper my daughter now knows when she hears the sounds of a mixer to come to the kitchen and ask for butter, which I like proud of. <laughs> she loves butter and who doesn't? So I wanted to remain traditional, you know, without the butter, but I just felt that the dough uh, was so much better with it. But just so you can see the, the texture and the consistency in the bowl. And you really want to get everything, right? We've got those nice 
ingredients to this go, right? Celebratory time of year, spring is coming your way if it's not there yet. Here, uh, all the trees are blossoming, there's flowers everywhere and it's snowing. So it is just that chaotic whirlwind. Astrologically, we're entering our restart of the year, new year energy, so it's great. What it looks like coming off the mixture uh, into your waiting bread dough bowl. And um, this is when you would want to go ahead and take the temperature. So you could use your digital thermometer, um, pop it in, and um, it should be somewhere between 75 and 78 degrees. All right, we're going to go ahead and cover this, and I'll show you how to do a fold. So this dough is going to uh, stay out for basically the remainder of the day. Again, it's going to sit around uh, breakfast time and then a series of three folds, which I'll show you how to do a fold now. And then um, it will, um, after the third fold, it's just going to hang out. You don't, uh, we went out to dinner last night. You can totally forget about your bread for like six hours. Such a luxury. Um, and then you'll want to take care of it into a shape that evening. So this I made um, uh, right before class started. So I wanted this to be a representation of what the dough will look like an hour after it's come off the mixer for you. So here it is. And uh, you can see just visually, right? Maybe you're feeling like, I don't know on this one. And then uh, it just turns into like a really luscious dough that I can see is already come together. It's silky, it's shiny. It looks um, really fun, actually. So um, the way we're going to further build strength into our dough, and I do this with all my sourdough breads, um, is through something called the slap and fold. So we're going to use the table to build tension with our bread dough. Turn the dough out onto the table. You want to have a little bit of water, not so much water that the dough can't stick because we will turn the dough out. We're going to slap it onto the table, gently pull it towards us, and then fold it over. Um, so this is the motion that you're going to do. That's why the music is so good for baking. It's very physical. Um, and so you don't want so much water the dough won't stick because that tension builds between stretching the dough between your hand and the table is what's going to elongate the gluten and then fold it or coil it sort of over itself over time. So you know, inside of this red dough, um, we want a nice, strong, tight gluten network so we can trap that gas that's going to be produced by the yeast as it rises. Uh, and we've got a lot of heavy ingredients here. So doing your folds correctly and making sure that you do do your folds is a great way um, to make sure that you're going to have a nice rise and a um, nice pop in the oven with your dough. So I've got just a little bit of water here. So you're going to do three of these folds. And um, Three folds space 60 minutes apart. And I just take my hand like so, a little bit of water on your fingertips will help you out. And I like to go around the outside edge and turn it out onto the table. And the first fold is um, arguably the hardest because you're just getting the dough organized. And what I mean by that is that you know, the strands of gluten, so there's interlocking chains of protein and water, that's what gluten is, and um, we're sort of, as we fold it, kind of belting them together to create a really strong network, and this is just our, our raw beginning as you go through your folds, like maybe we'll do one right before the end of class, um, the dough will continue to get smoother and smoother, um, and by the third fold, it will be like a really nice, tight ball when you're done your fold. 
So it's always helpful to know what to expect um, because a lot of times in baking, especially when you're doing something new, um, you know, it's, it's hard to know. Is it supposed to look like this? So first time, it's gonna be a little shaggy. Second time, it's gonna come together. Third time, you're gonna have a nice tight uh, ball at the end of your fold. A little bit of water on the table, a little bit of water on your hand. You might wanna have your bench knife around. And then, uh, so I'm looking down at the dough. I'm gonna imagine that half the part closest to my body, I'm gonna pick up towards me and then slap it over towards you. And this is the motion of turning my hand out. So pick it up, fold it over. Now I'm going to take from the side. So I'm imagining it half, this half is gonna to touch the table and we'll keep going. Picking it up, slapping it down, folding it away from me. And I'm doing this, <laughs> I'm doing the robot. I'm doing a quarter turn with my upper body to sort of twist the dough so that this half is the part that sticks. If you just wanna think about the left-hand portion of the dough on the outside is what should be sticking to the table, then you're good. So it will develop what we affectionately call the fluke cloak, which is like a tight looking balloon surface. And that'll happen by your third fold. Um, like I said, it'll still be a little shaggy after the first. That's where your bench knife comes in. This still looks pretty good to me. And a um, little bit of flour now. And you can use your bench knife to sort of finalize your fold. And what I mean by that is just tucking a little bit of the bread dough um, between the bench knife and the table and just giving it a little push to tighten. So push to build some strength. And you can see just as I pull it, how it's becoming a nice, somewhat tight ball. A little bit of flour. And don't be afraid to, you know, handle your dough. Uh, you don't want to add a ton of flour to it, but you do want to be able to touch it. So it's just a light dusting of flour after that fold. Uh, and when there is a little coat of flour on it, you can even use your hands, point them together. I'm pinching a little bit of the bread dough between my hands and the table and then I'm just dragging it towards me to get a little bit more tension on the dough. And then you're all set. If your first fold didn't look like that, that is totally normal. Uh, and it just takes a lot of practice. Okay, um, I'm going to check on the bread dough in the oven and then we'll do some shake. Bench knives are incredible for cleaning up your work area as well. So something um, I skipped a little um, in order to save us some time was dividing the bread dough. So you will um, go through a series of three folds. So what we just did, 60 minutes apart, then let the dough stay out on another five hours. And then after that, you're going to divide it. So uh, you'll take the dough out of the container and sprinkle it with some flour using your digital scale. Um, I cut like, uh, you can kind of eyeball it. You know, you're gonna want three strands for your braid. So I'm going to eyeball it into three portions. You want them at 333 grams a piece. 
Um, although I will say it's better for you to have a single portion of dough rather than a bunch of small pieces. So if it's a little over or a little under, that's okay. You know, we push the eggs into the dough, it sort of becomes some shape anyways. But 333 grams um, is what you want each portion ideally to be. And then um, you're gonna pre-shape it and then shape it a few more times till that dough is ready to be made into a strand. So there's some resting portions uh, in between all of that. So I'm not going to divide the dough for you um, because I wanted to have these ready to show you how to shape, which is the super fun part. But um, when you divide the dough, you will um, turn it into the pre-shape is around. And then we go to like the sort of uh, sausage shape, I call it, and then we'll roll it into tubes and braid. So um, the pre-shape, I'll show you on the table. If you've got, you've divided your dough, if you've got a chunk right there, uh, let's pretend this is that. What I will do is um, the table will be dusted with flour. So the surface of your dough that's touching the table, that will become the outside. If you've got any little bits or pieces of dough um, from you know, getting the correct um, weight, those go on the inside and then I'll simply fold it over. Um, so everything's in, now I've got a floured surface to work with. And then uh, the dough is pretty stiff so you can get away with, um, you can see what I'm doing a little bit with my hands. I'm just using my fingers to um, basically make what I call a purse. I'm just bringing the edges of the dough um, all the way into the middle. You can do it in your hands. If you shape pizza, this is very similar. Some people shape pizza this way. You just stretch the outside edges and get them in um, to kiss underneath. So you've got a little seam. But either way, you can walk it along the table and press the dough between your finger and the table as you go to create a seam and a round. Or you can stretch and have it go that way. And then you'll get your round. Then you want to leave that up. Uh, on the sheet pan to relax for about 30 minutes before going into um, our sausage pre-shape, we'll call it, for uh, the final strands for the brain. So I'll show you a couple different sheets, which is why we have so much dough here. It's our first time in the community kitchen here in Hamilton, although oddly enough, um, my husband and I got married here. We we're building a house actually on the property that we got married on, which is great. Uh, and we had our reception like on Thanksgiving in here. So full circle. Uh, you want to take your, um, okay, that's right. So you've made your pre shape you've got your round, you want to cover it so it doesn't dry out um, as you're giving it that rest. So anytime we introduce tension into the dough, we need to let it relax in order to shape it well. Um, otherwise, you're just fighting the dough and you're not going to have a pleasant experience. Your bread is going to look the way you want it to either. So walk away. Uh, so I've shaped my divided the dough, pre-shaped it into a circle covered it for 30 minutes and now to get to this uh, shape I just simply uh, turn it over so the top becomes the bottom and then uh, I take the little make little ears on the side and I stretch them over uh, so they overlap kiss a little bit in the middle and then you're just going to roll it up I say like a jelly roll thinking of a jelly roll cake you roll it up into itself to create a tube and then you wanna let that rest. So um, we are just giving the dough periods of rest till we can really stretch it out. So this is the fun part. You've got your, uh, again, probably 20, 30, 30 minute rest. And now I'm going to start um, making a baguette like shape, so a long cylinder. You want them to be, uh, you know, at least I'd say uh, 12 inches to, uh, longer um, if you want 
something that's going to become a circle. So um, I'm looking down at the dough and I'm gonna just put a little indent in the middle and start to wind it into itself, weaving about an inch lip here. And then same thing, starting on the right side, going all the way over, although I'm tucking it into that inch lip. And now I've got somewhat longer too. I'm gonna place my hands one over the other and I'm kind of cupping, cupping the dough so it's tight between here and there on the table. Again, you'll see there's not no flour, no water really here. One hand's over the other, I'm gonna keep it going. And then uh, once I've got it sort of the diameter that I want between my two hands, I'll start to move my hands away from each other down the length of the dough and then the end, you're gonna finish. I say like you're waxing a car, I realize maybe not everybody does that, but you are going to do this at the end to finish it off. And I'll start with one and then go down. Um, and it's great to just keep giving it little pauses. So again, a little rest before we stretch it to its final length. So one fold over with a, a lip and then rolling it in all the way to create a seam running along the bottom. One hand over the other, I'm really cupping it. I'm pressing down. So, uh, and if this is just really not working for you, a little bit of flour might be helpful, but same principle we're doing here is using the tension between the, your hands and the table to elongate the dough. And one of your hands is going to be stronger than the other. So after you've done your first one, look down at it and see like, okay, I can really ease up uh, with my, like for instance, my right hand is my dominant hand. So you can, you can definitely end up with like a baseball shape that's Start to smell really good. All right, next one. So winding it up, got my inch lip, winding, hands over top, and then moving out the side. Uh, again, I learned how to make this bread or was introduced to my first version of this bread. Um, at the Morning Glory Bay Grand Bar Harbor May will always be very uh, special time in my life for me to remember kind of falling in love with um, a bakery and bakers and just what that um, social space in a community can do. And um, I just am having such fond memories of these Easter breeds. Um, after I left college, I went to College of the Atlantic in Bar Harbor, which is how I found myself there at um, the Great Morning Glory. And I um, had a degree, like philosophy, gender studies, wasn't quite sure what I was going to do. And um, I moved to Vermont the day I graduated college, and I ended up working at Red Hen Baking Company in Middlesex, Vermont for several years. And that really sealed the deal for me. Um, in terms of loving a bakery, working in a bakery, wanting to be a baker. And um, we made a lot of bread for restaurants there and we hand rolled baguettes, probably eight or 900 baguettes a day. And um, I remember the day the owner came in and said he got a baguette rolling machine. And we were all shocked and horrified and um, it is incredible just how much uh, muscle memory baking truly is. And I don't think I would want to roll that many baguettes, but if I'm making this look easy, I was required to do it for like three hours a day for a very long time in my life. For four years felt like a long time in your 20s. Now it's like, whatever, what year is it? That's where I'm at. I have a two-year-old, so 
we are having a lot of fun. But really um, leaning into it and just as you go, really stretching it out. Okay, got two more. Some folks I know, um, you know, this is not their jam, this part. I love it. They don't. Uh, you can roll the dough out with a rolling pin, like a firm touch, and um, roll it into a rectangle and just roll up that rectangle, just wind the dough into itself to make a two. But I think this is a little bit more elegant. The nice thing about baking, any way that you learned how to do it, there's also probably five other ways. So it can just keep you interested for a lifetime, which is where I'm at. Some things to pair this bread with. So this is coming off the season of candied citrus. So next Saturday, I know I'll see some of you again for the hot crust buns workshop. And uh, that has uh, candied citrus peel in it. So serving this bread, some things you could do, you know, for your holiday table. Um, we've got a nice white Italian wine, um, some marmalade, some candied citrus slices, all those things would go great. Um, served with this bread. Okay. Love it. So, um, uh, the starter is uh, the root of everything. So the starter is what I feed and maintain. And uh, I have kept that one for about 10 years. It's taken a lot of abuse and neglect. I have left it for about two months unattended. Um, pandemic, had a baby, we're moving. I don't know, I didn't feed it uh, every week like I recommend in my book that you should. So I am you. <laughs> And uh, it was fine. So I took it out of the fridge after about two months, you know, even after a couple days, depending on the temperature, your starter will develop um, like colored alcohol on the top. It's called the hooch. And it can be gray, it can be kind of yellow. Um, if it's pink or orange, just go ahead and toss your starter out. That's a bacteria that's colonizing the starter that we really don't want. Uh, but if it's just an off color, um, can be even like grayish. Um, just pour, you're going to pour most of that starter out when you go to refresh it anyway. So just pour that hooch off. That alcohol is just lighter than um, the flour and the water. So it's just rising to the top. And uh, go ahead and refresh it. Here's the thing it's going to take a little time after it comes out of such a period of dormancy for it to get the right flavor balance and to be really predictable. So if it's you know going to be more work for you to get your starter back to life than it is to take a week or two and make a fresh new one, um, those are times where you know you might want to consider actually just going ahead and making a new one. Um, so up to you. I know that we like to talk a lot about how old our starters are. And that can be, you know, bragging points in the world of bakers. <laughs> but uh, there's no shame to starting a fresh one uh, if you need to. And uh, I usually keep a couple going. And the difference between the starter and the leaven is simply that, uh, like, let's say my recipe calls, like this Easter bread here calls for, I believe, like 100 grams or so of starter. I keep about 250 grams of starter on hand just in my little container that you saw. It's about a uh, quart-sized container. 
So I, if I look at a bread recipe and I see that, okay, I need 100 grams. I know that I generally have like 250 grams of starter on hand and that I will have, you know, 50 grams of starter left over after removing the 100 grams of starter called for for the bread. So I can just pull what I need um, for this dough out of my container of starter that I've been maintaining and um, tending to for, uh, you know, 10 years. But let's say I'm making two batches of this dough. That's not really going to, you know, and I'm going to need 200 grams or so of starter. I could use all of what's in my jar, but maybe I'm, you know, worried that I won't have enough leftover to feed or something. So when you increase the amount of dough that you make and you increase the amount of leavening that you need, that is when you'll start to look at uh, making 11. And that's what you would do in a professional situation. You know, for making a hundred loaves of bread and not four, uh, you can keep a very small amount of starter and then use a portion of that starter, feed it a larger amount of flour and water. And that's going to be called your leaven. And that's what's going to go into your bread dough. There are um, a lot of bread books out there. Tartine is a great bread book. If you don't have it, it's just uh, plastic at this point. And I do believe that they call the leaven just that refreshment of your starter that you do in the evening. So if bakers have this language that we use, but it can be really confusing and frustrating because we use the same word, we're not always talking about the exact same thing. So uh, if you're just making one loaf, you probably have enough starter on hand to just pour it out of your container. If you're making two, three, or the other day we made four of these, um, we're going to do like a, a small bake um, for pre-orders around Easter for these breads. That's when I'm going to make 11 um, any time that I need more than my starter can uh, handle or more volume than I have. So our bread is coming out nicely. I want to get uh, just a little bit more color. And um, if you're curious about checking the temperature of your bread, you want it to be um, 190 degrees when it's done baking. That's in general for Wheaties breads. Yeah, it looks really good. It smells really good in here. So let's do some shapes. Um, I'll do the first shape is the simple braid. I was really fortunate in um, 2016 to be in an article in Bon Appetit magazine. And at that time, I had really elaborate um, pies I was making, just pies with like decorated with trees and moons and probably not supposed to, you know, just wild uh, toppings to my pie out of pie dough. And uh, when I was making the doll um, the other day, which if you came in, please class hide, nice to see you. But um, you know, when I was making these the other day, I just really felt that energy come back. And so, you know, maybe you're making this dough for the first time and you want to make it how the recipe says, that's what I recommend you do <laughs> if you're doing something for the first time. But um, if this continues to become a tradition to you, I really encourage you to use uh, this dough as a sculptural object and you could maybe embed other things in it um, and get really seasonal with it. But it is, um, it's a delicious dough to eat and it should be eaten at the holiday table, but it is also um, just a great dough to work with and have fun. So um, I'll walk you through the braid um, and unfortunately it'll be sort of mirrored backwards, but um, if you, need to email me or you need any clarification on how to do the shaping, just let me know after class. But I'm looking at it, so I've got my, um, I like to leave the tops actually open. I don't um, adhere them like that, but I'm gonna, I've got um, a right, a middle and a left. So you're gonna take the right and just make an X 
and that becomes the middle. The left goes over the right. So you're just going over the center one. Down you go. And then I finish up the top here and I'll kind of, uh, I wait to do the ends till it's on the sheet pan. So you've got a sheet pan lined with parchment. You've got your braid. I'll pick it up, put it onto the parchment elongate it that way and then to seal off the ends sometimes I'll just see what looks the best so this guy I'm actually going to just tuck under tuck under take this one pull it because I like to have a blunt end to the dough there's a lot of tucking and pulling and prodding when you get to the end of your bread dough that one I'll go under and over. And then you have your braid. So as I mentioned, I, I don't put the eggs in now um, because, right, it's so tight from the shaping. It's so tight from being woven. I'd just be fighting it, especially using a raw egg. That raw egg is just going to crack in your hands and get all over your bread dough. It's very stressful. So um, I let it proof. So now I will cover it with um, a kitchen towel, put it in a warm location, and um, this will proof. We'll probably bake this uh, either right before we go to bed tonight, or you can pop it in the fridge and bake it tomorrow morning. But that's the shape for the braid. And then uh, we'll do a wreath. And then we'll have some extra dough here um, to do a doll, if anybody wants to see what it looks like. Oh, yeah. Okay, so if I can just, if I can just encourage you to bake boldly, again, there's so much um, gorgeous fat in this dough, it's going to turn into like a mahogany color the further you let it go. So you saw sort of a golden brown, and then this is really the color um, that I want to see coming out of the bread. So I think it just has like a few minutes left. Gorgeous. Uh, all right, so let's do the wreath. So you want uh, longer portions for the wreath. So I'm just going to extend these a little bit more. And just those micro rests on the bench are incredible. So this is a great little project to like step outside and check out the weather, call a friend for a minute, not your best friend because you're gonna talk for so long, you're gonna forget what you're doing. But uh, Check the mail, you know, this dough, once you do the pre-shape, you've got several little resting periods. So you can just anticipate thinking about it, how your day is gonna go. You just wanna stick around the kitchen for a while. Um, this dough is very malleable and it will go into the right shape, but it just needs a little time between each introduction of the patient. Okay, so we're making these ones longer so that we can um, turn it into a, a circle or a ring. Yeah, we can finally turn those uh, really crazy fans off. So if you've been enduring the sound of the fans over the course of this morning, it's really hard. It's nice and quiet. let it finish um, so same idea we're going to make the braid transfer it onto sheet pen waiting with parchment and we'll turn it into the um wreath on the on the parchment it was so fun to cut into one of these yesterday um and Again, at the beginning of the class, everybody asks, how do you eat it? And um, it is a whole meal in and of itself. And it does feel very celebratory and fun to um, have something that's just, you know, different than um, your typical um, sliced bread, but you can slice it. You get that great cross section of the um, baked egg.
So I've got a, a little bit longer braid. I'm gonna stretch it here on the table and then onto the sheet pan. So I'll show you two. One thing that I do that I really like to make um, this particular toddler is waving to us, um, to make this particular shape, which is just a whole um, round. This is also a version of a wreath. Um, I love this one for the table. So rather than uh, getting these ends to come together on the sheet pan, um, I will just go ahead, you can finish it off and then um, just tuck it into each other and you get. Do, 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 do. Kind of a, um, a Celtic not looking shape. So that's just with everything tucked in and then tuck all the ends in, basically create a little spiral. Okay, I'm going to take the dough out just so I don't totally forget this in there. We'll let that rest so we can stretch it into a wreath. Yeah, I'm really happy with this color here. So nice, beautiful, bold bake, so shiny um, from that egg wash. So if you can kind of see what I mean by lacquer, um, just that double coat will get you this intense, intense shine. It's almost like it's been um, brushed with a simple syrup. So, so excited. I love them. They're just, they're so pleasing as a baker. There's so many things that I bake that, you know, make sense. Like cookies and brownies and so much better, but this is just lovely to do something celebratory and different. Okay. So I've got um, a horseshoe looking shape and there's really no elegant way to do this, but you're just going to start um, tucking your pieces of the braid into each other. Um, and I'll sort of look and see, okay, well, where might that one cross? So I'm gonna cross there and that's gonna meet up with that one. And I always put, um, you know, an egg or something here because people won't be able to tell. Okay, cross. And you're looking for, uh, it's always going to be a little thinner on that side because you've just, Take in the tapered ends and um, basically tangled them together. So I come to the other side and just start to try and widen the portion over here. And as they proof, you know, if there's, you can see several portions of the braid, as they proof, it will proof into itself. and puff up so it won't be so noticeable. And then you can just gently sort of open it. Um, some folks like to put a cup in the middle um, to prove, but now you've got your wreath and I'll share some pictures. Um, on Instagram of what these end up coming out like. Okay. And then um, for a doll, this is just a, a fun shape anyhow. Um, okay, we'll move that. You can fit uh, about two breads per sheet pan if you're making more than one for whatever reason. Um, so for the doll, I take, um, just hold it in my hand like a horseshoe, and then you're just going to twist it around itself, like so. And then you leave that there to proof. And then that is also um, another way you can make a simpler style wreath that's not a braid. Um, you'll take this, 
take your rope and you go real long with it. Um, so then the shaped doughs will get covered and um, proofed overnight until they do what we call pass the poke test. So you'll uh, just gently jab the dough with your finger. And if it like bounces right back to meet you, um, it's not done, it's not ready. You want to let it fill with gas and become a really sort of pillow feeling. And um, if you poke the dough with your finger and it leaves the indent and it slowly rises back to meet you, um, then you're in the zone and you can go ahead and um, either chill the bread if you can't bake it right then, or you can go ahead and um, preheat your oven. If you press in on the bread dough and you hear gas coming out of it, it's probably overproofed, but um, I do believe uh, that most folks baking at home um, chronically under proof. So I encourage home bakers in particular to really push the proof of your bread dough. And um, if you're used to making sourdough bread and you're, you've had doughs collapse um, or you've overproofed them, um, I encourage you to really let your enriched sourdough breads go for as long as possible because um, proofing wise, they're almost indestructible. Even when I was making, um, you know, testing the spread in Florida, 80 degree weather, crazy humidity, I left it out all night and it was gorgeous the next morning. So um, there's something special about an enriched sourdough that you really can't, like you'd have to try very hard to overproof it. Um, so just really let it go. Um, so horseshoe shape, I elongated this one a little bit more and then just wrapping into a twist and then um, here, get a little bit more twisted. You can go through the other side and then you get a nice wreath this way as well. It's like a, a knot. Um, so I will put all of the eggs in the dough tomorrow morning after it's nice and proofed. And then let's check out our dough one more time over here. And then I think we're getting close. Sorry, talking into the wall. I think we're getting close to um, done here, folks. So if you don't have um, any burning questions, about your Easter breads, then um, I think we will start to wrap up. Uh, like I mentioned, traditionally, this could be decorated with a bit of a glaze. So I did a, a powdered sugar, um, just like a little bit of powder, probably 100 grams of powdered sugar. Um, 40 grams heavy cream. You could zest a lemon into that. You could put some almond extract, vanilla extract in it, um, drizzle it over the braid. And then the non parallels and the um, sliced almonds are like just really fun and festive. And um, if you missed the beginning, I just love it. Um, so how do you eat it? So we, um, cut it into slices and then I take the egg out and the shell generally comes right off. And then you take the shell off the egg and you can totally eat these eggs. Um, that was a big bite, but, and then you've got your bread. So fun. Um, a note on, sorry, <laughs> it is really just a very interactive, fun, especially with kids around. Um, so a note on the braids, you wanna let them cool on the sheet pan um, for just a little bit um, after they come out of the oven. And then you want to uh, transfer them to a wire rack to fully cool 
the long braids like this are gonna um, need a little bit of time to set in the middle. So just be um, mindful. A couple of other things you could do um, if you did make candy, I, if you did make candy citrus peel, you're going to have like an orange simple syrup left over. So you could brush it with simple syrup, but I just love how rustic and beautiful they are. Like there's a little splatter from the egg wash that looks like the egg has been painted and um, it's such a simple joy of this time of year. And like I mentioned, um, we've got some, we're going to do some Italian wine with this later. And then also um, just pairing it with other things, some nice cultured butter. And um, I got the lid on really good, but some homemade marmalade. So this is just um, leftover from the process of canning the orange peel. So if anybody wants the recipe for um, canning orange peel, because I've mentioned it a few times during this workshop, just send me an email. I'll send it to you. It's got a video. Um, also that has the um, citrus almond flour cake in it. So we're, we're coming out of citrus season. So we're using up our preserves a little early, but um, next month I'll be doing a lot on pies. I'm really coming around to pie dough again at this time in my life. So we've got some virtual and in-person classes on pies coming up. And so we're just gonna get into all the summer fruits and summer snack cakes. So, um, but first, the Lenten season and Easter. So thank you for joining me this morning. I hope that this becomes, um, if not a ritual that you do every year, just something that you can share this year um, with your friends and family. And if we don't have any more questions, um, thank you for coming this morning. And I know I'll see some of you next Saturday. So um, any last minute burning questions? Thank you so much, Tara. <clears throat> That's a wonderful celebratory. Happy Aries season. Yeah, <laughs> my husband and my daughter are both Aries. So we've got birthday, birthday. Violet was born on Easter in a snowstorm. The power went out in the hospital and I was like, of course, that's just what happens. Like when you have a baby, the power goes out. That seemed normal. So um, we are just getting ready for a big uh, party season here in our home. So. Okay, awesome. Thank you everyone for joining. It was wonderful to see you this morning and um, we'll see you again soon. Take care, bye.